Good morning. I'm Brandon Steckler, technical editor of Motor Age Magazine. I've been a technician now for almost 26 years. And I got to tell you, of all the drivability problems I've been faced with in my career, the intermittent misfire is by far one of the most difficult to solve. And here's the reason why. As technicians, we like to analyze data to make diagnostic decisions. But the problem is, if we're capturing that data at the time the misfire, in this case, is not occurring, we're going to be hard pressed to find the problem easily. However, capturing the correct data, even during an intermittent misfire, can offer you some insight into what type of misfire we're experiencing. Whether it's a misfire due to lack of spark, a misfire due to improper air fuel ratio, or a misfire due to an engine mechanical concern. Stick with me through this episode of The Trainer and find out more. This edition of The Trainer is brought to you by Auto. To see the full line of professional diagnostic tools and equipment from Auto, visit www.autel.com. Now, by definition, a misfire is technically a slowing of the engine's crankshaft. We can have misfires, as mentioned, due to lack of spark, lack of proper air fuel ratio, or an even engine mechanical insert. However, there are other causes of misfires. I've seen worn accessory drive belt pulleys flag misfires due to the vibration caused, causing an engine to bind. I've seen worn inner CV joints in axles cause misfires to be flagged. But the type of misfires I'm talking about in today's videos are the true misfires, the ones that directly affect combustion. So let's consider the three types of misfires, beginning first with a misfire due to lack of spark. I will just call it a spark misfire. Let's think about what happens. When the air and fuel mixture come into the cylinder, the cylinder with the valve closed is designed to squeeze those contents and create pressure and heat energy. And when a spark is introduced, that heat energy pushes the air and fuel mixture past its flash point and combustion initiates. But in an internal combustion, gasoline spark ignition engine, if that spark is missing, combustion is not going to take place. So let's follow through with that chain of events. Assuming a combustion event does not take place, i.e. a misfire occurs, when that cylinder's exhaust valve opens, and the exhaust stroke occurs, those contents that are normally spent, the oxygen and the fuel head downstream out towards the tailpipe. On its way, it comes in contact with the heated oxygen sensor and or, depending on configuration, the wide band air fuel ratio sensor. Now, since both of those sensors are designed to detect oxygen, both the oxygen and the fuel that are making its way across that sensor, the fuel molecules tend to get in the way of the oxygen content. And although it is seen through the eyes of the feedback loop as a lean mixture, it's not extremely lean. As a result, we can anticipate elevated fuel trim. Now let's take that backwards just a little bit and discuss a misfire due to improper air fuel ratio or lack of fuel delivery. In that scenario, if, for instance, a fuel injector were to become disabled for any reason, the oxygen made it to the cylinder, but the fuel did not. Once again, we would experience a lack of combustion, known as a misfire, and when that exhaust valve opens, the contents push downstream across the wideband air fuel ratio sensor, and the oxygen sensor are seen as extremely lean because of the high amount of oxygen content undisrupted by fuel molecules. As a result, the fuel trim will be even further elevated. Now for a moment, I want to talk about the operation of the catalytic converter. And I don't want to get into too much detail. We're going to save that for a later video. But what I do want to mention that's very important is the catalytic converter operates as it does due to a chemical reaction. Chemistry takes place inside that catalytic converter and those fuel molecules and oxygen molecules are chemically converted into something else. However, 
that catalytic converter requires proper feed gas to function properly. And if it doesn't have what it needs to operate properly, it's not going to work properly. We can count on the operation of the catalyst in the case of an intermittent misfire to give us some information that will provide insight into what type of misfire we are experiencing. But please don't take my word for it. Let me show you on the vehicle. So the first thing I want to point out is I'm going to build this vehicle on the global OBD2 side of the Scantle and the PCM. There's no need to go into enhanced data because the information we need can be found on the global side as it's required by OBD2 law to be there. The next thing I'm going to do is access live data. And today we are using the Autel MS919. This is an excellent scan tool. It provides great coverage and also has some really nifty features because it offers PID graphing, which I'll demonstrate here shortly. Now, as you can see, there's many PIDs available for us to view, even on the global side. However, all these PIDs seem to get in the way and very hard for my brain to process. So what I'm going to do is build a customized PID list. The customized PID list is going to allow me to view only the PIDs I desire to see. In this case, we're going to be looking at the rear oxygen sensor and the wideband air fuel ratio sensor, otherwise known as equivalence ratio or lambda. Once I have them selected, I'm going to show them only the two we desire to see and I'm going to place them into a graphing mode. By graphing them, we get a visual representation of what's happening with the PIDs. It also provides a history, meaning we don't have to see the PID at that exact moment. We can simply refer to the graph. As this graph transitions across the screen, it's moving relatively fast for what I desire to see. So I'm going to change the time base on it and zoom out and put a lot more time on the screen. I will then start the car and we will see the data plot across the screen. As the data plots across the screen, I'm going to fill my screen to make it easier to view. In green, we have the wide band air fuel ratio sensor plotting the PID equivalence ratio, otherwise known as lambda. The blue trace represents the rear oxygen sensor. As, as you can see, currently there's a lot of activity happening right now. That's simply because the catalytic converter is not yet functioning. It's not hot enough and has not been lit off. Once we have enough heat energy inside the catalytic converter, it will begin to work chemically and you would see the rear oxygen sensor stabilize. We'll get a better look at that when we are analyzing the data at the comfort of our workstation. The first thing I've done here was back probe the control wire to ignition coil number four. On the other end, is an alligator clip that's going to be referencing ground through a fuse jumper and it's going to allow me to drive the ignition coil and disable it temporarily to induce a spark misfire. And if you listen carefully you should hear the vehicle misfire. And then it returns to normal. Now I'm going to come on this side of the vehicle and induce a misfire by disabling a fuel injector for the same amount of time. And if you listen carefully, you'll hear the engine misfire. Okay, the first thing I want to do is offer a little bit of a disclaimer. The testing I'm doing, I have lots of practice with this test. And I mention that because anytime you disable an ignition coil, or you create a misfire, I should say, but fuel is still being introduced to that cylinder, you can overload the catalytic converter and it can overheat. That chemical reaction gets too strong and it can overheat and melt down, self-destruct. I don't mean explode, but I mean cause that catalytic converter to self-destruct. And uh, it's a lot of money and it's your responsibility as a technician. So I'm going, ahead, I'm going to go ahead and say, do not perform the experiments I'm performing now. I've done it hundreds of times over many, many years, and uh, I'm aware of how to go about doing it without destroying the catalyst. I don't want to see you make a mistake and destroy your own catalyst, a co-worker's catalyst, a family member, or, or even worse, a customer's car. So with that being said, let's refer to the scan tool and show you the difference in the scan data between
a spark induced misfire and a fuel injector induced misfire. So the reason we chose the two PIDs we did, again, limiting the amount of PIDs we place on our scan tool, speeds up its refresh rate and allows us to see more accurate data. Placing the PIDs in a graphic mode on our MS919 allows us to make action-reaction comparative measure. So we can see how things are reacting throughout the misfire process, no matter which misfire we have. Inducing a spark type misfire by disabling the ignition coil, we are introducing the fuel and the oxygen from that lack of combustion event taking place to the catalytic converter. As a result, our primary sensor, our wideband air fuel ratio sensor, is going to see that oxygen elevated and it's going to reflect that as an increase in lambda or a lean condition. The oxygen and the fuel make its way into the catalyst and as it's lit off, the catalyst is going to chemically convert that fuel into less harmful gases. As a result, it's going to use up the oxygen content that's stored in its belly. The net result, the oxygen content leaving the catalytic converter, going past the rear O2 sensor, is going to lack oxygen content. The rear O2 sensor is going to show high voltage output. However, in the case of a fuel injector induced misfire, a lack of fuel, that lack of combustion event is going to expel plain oxygen down the exhaust stream. Once again, past the wideband air fuel ratio sensor indicating even further higher lean conditions, a higher lambda value. And our catalytic converter is going to show that excessive oxygen content leaving the cat past the rear O2 sensor. And that rear O2 sensor, because of the abundance of oxygen, is going to show a relatively low voltage output value. But again, don't take my word for it. Let's go analyze the data at the comfort of our workstation together. So we are connected to my Autel MS919 by way of TeamViewer, which makes it really convenient because I can access this scan tool anywhere in the world as long as I have an internet connection at both my location and the unit, the MS919's location. Um, before we get into this, I do want to mention a reminder that a catalyst operates due to chemistry chemical reactions that take place. And I promise you, we are going to cover in depth catalytic converter functionality in a later video coming up sometime this year. But um, what I'm trying to show you here is in blue, we've got uh, a data trace plotted from my rear oxygen sensor. And uh, I'm gonna go back a little bit in time. And you will see early on when you saw me capture this live on the car, the catalytic converter was not yet lit off. So in blue, you see a lot of activity from the rear oxygen sensor as these trends in short-term fuel trim take place. We're actually seeing them respond in the equivalence ratio from our lambda sensor, our wideband air fuel ratio sensor input. So this is not the ideal time to perform this test because it takes the chemistry from the catalytic converter to demonstrate what it is we need to see. So I allow some time to go by at elevated RPM, maybe 2,500 RPMs, and you could see slowly but surely the catalyst begins to light off. And when I mention that, it's because look at the frequency. I did not change engine speed here, but the frequency of the transitions from the rear oxygen sensor start to diminish. And that is not a function of the rear oxygen sensor. It is, in fact, the functionality of the catalytic converter. Said another way, when a catalytic converter is lit off and it's functioning, it's hot, it's ready to rock and roll, it is indeed storing oxygen and then using oxygen, meaning there is very little net oxygen output. And this is why the rear O2 sensor trace in blue begins to stabilize over time. So what happens, oops, there we go. What happens is, as it begins to stabilize, I induce a misfire. Now, if you recall, I did two misfires. The first misfire was to disable spark. I created a misfire because no spark was taking place in one of the cylinders. That misfire is indicative by a rise here in our wideband air-fuel ratio sensor trace. And as I mentioned, anytime you have a misfire at all, 
oxygen is going to be introduced to the exhaust stream. And that's what we are seeing here. A few moments later, after I plug the coil back in and I allow it to stabilize, I introduce a new misfire. Except this misfire, although it feels exactly the same to the driver and it sounds exactly the same to, to anybody standing around a vehicle, this misfire has nothing to do with the spark at all. This misfire, I eliminated the operation of the fuel injector, meaning no fuel is being introduced. So no spark is being introduced here. No fuel is being introduced here. So these are my two areas of concern. Now, let's let's pay attention to the correlation of the rear oxygen sensor during each misfire. Again, this misfire was created by removing spark. So as I mentioned earlier in the video, when we remove spark, what goes into the cylinder? What comes out of the cylinder? Air and fuel will go into the cylinder. Air and fuel leave the cylinder. So the fuel that goes downstream and, and oxygen that goes downstream comes in contact with our wideband air fuel ratio sensor first. This is what we're seeing here. And the oxygen is causing it to rise, indicating what would be known as a lean condition. It's not truly lean. It's just seeing the oxygen content. However, look at the rear O2 sensor trace. If you recall from years past, since the late 70s, a zirconia style traditional oxygen sensor like we have in the rear of this vehicle will transition very high when it sees a lack of oxygen. So again, I mentioned during this misfire, a spark induced misfire, oxygen and fuel make its way downstream. That fuel, when it hits the catalytic converter that is lit off and it's functioning properly, it's doing its job, that additional fuel is going to be further catalyzed inside the catalytic converter, meaning any remaining oxygen that was in that catalyst is going to be used up processing or converting, chemically converting that additional fuel. So the net result is what should come out of the tailpipe exiting the catalytic converter? Almost no oxygen at all. And that is why the O2 sensor trace transitions high. However, if we go over here, we reestablish spark and the engine is no longer misfiring for a period of time. Here we introduce the second type of misfire. We unplug a fuel injector. Now, although the vehicle is misfiring and oxygen is also being pumped downstream towards the wideband air fuel ratio sensor, no fuel is being pumped downstream towards the wideband air fuel ratio sensor. So again, we see a lean condition, a rise in the green trace, the wideband air fuel ratio sensor input. However, the blue trace doesn't transition high like we saw earlier. It transitions low. Why? Because now there is additional oxygen in the exhaust stream, and that is what we are seeing poking its way out of the back of the catalytic converter and being picked up by our rear O2 sensor. So it's the combination of these two that show what's actually happening, what type of misfire is occurring. And it gives you some insight right from the driver's seat. I hope you're able to capitalize on some of the quick tips I provide for you today. The Auto MS 919 made night work of this diagnosis and its graphing capability made it very easy to analyze the data. I'm Brandon Steckler, Technical Editor of Motor Age Magazine. Thanks for joining me. We'd like to see you next time on the next episode of The Trainer. Take care. To see the full line of Autel's diagnostic equipment and platforms, be sure to visit www.autel.com.